The Sodom and Gomorrah runes were found in the 1990s by Ron Wyatt. The remains show how they were destroyed and what life was like there before the fire and brimstone fell. In this episode, we'll also look at scripture to see how the biblical record helps us interpret those archaeological findings around the Dead Sea. If you're new here, this channel exists to help you locate and interpret scriptures that help you solve Bible mysteries just like this. If you find that useful, consider subscribing. Now, there are actually several archaeological sites that are up for consideration to be Sodom and Gomorrah from a scientific standpoint. Two on the Jordanian side of the Dead Sea and four separate cities on the western Israeli side. Some even consider that the cities were underwater in the Dead Sea. These sites differ. The two Jordanian sites and the underwater site are traditional archaeological sites where the remains are made of limestone, which were covered with dirt or excavated, or they're salt encrusted in the ocean. But the bottom line is, they're hard, rocky remains. The sites on the Israeli side of the Dead Sea are ancient ruins unlike any other in the world. They're comprised entirely of ash. Ash in the shape of ancient buildings, pyramids, temples, streets, city walls, and sphinx. And embedded within these structures are millions of balls of sulfur. So if we're going to uncover what life was like in the Sin Cities, we have to be looking in the right place. And the most important factor in deciding which of these sites is the real one is which ones are consistent with the historical and biblical record. Josephus, the ancient historian, had this to say in his Wars of the Jews. Now this country is then so sadly burnt up that nobody cares to come at it. It was of old a most happy land, both for the fruits it bore and the riches of its cities, although it be now all burnt up. It is related how, for the impiety of its inhabitants, it was burnt by lightning, in consequence of which there are still the remainders of that divine fire and the traces or shadows of the five cities are still to be seen. So, based on Josephus, the ruins of the cities were visible at the beginning of the second century, almost 2,000 years after the destruction of the city. This seems to eliminate the two which were dirt covered and certainly the one that's underwater. The ruins in Israel are also more importantly consistent chemically and physically with the biblical record. By turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, he condemned them to extinction, making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. So the Bible tells us to expect the runes to be ashes, just like we find on the western side of the Dead Sea. From the air, these sites and their ashen runes appear a different color than the rock and the sand surrounding the countryside, allowing those who are interested to clearly delineate the extent of the towns and their ashen buildings. Of course, we got to remember that the full extent of wooden buildings at that time that encompassed the towns might have extended quite a bit further into the plain of the Jordan. The ashes are the remains of the limestone buildings only. That is because chemically, the ash deposits, and that's all that's left of the previous buildings, have been tested in laboratories and are calcium sulfate, exactly the material you'd expect to find when buildings made of limestone or calcium carbonate is exposed to sulfur in the presence of extreme heat. The ancient name for sulfur was brimstone, and we are told in Genesis the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah sulfur and fire from the Lord out of heaven, and he overthrew those cities and all the valley and all the inhabitants of the cities and what grew on the ground. So the two ingredients necessary for the formation of these type of runes was present, sulfur and extreme heat. But how extreme was the heat? All over the region, on most of the runes, we see a bizarre wavy pattern to the ash. 
This is the result of thermal ionization, where atoms repel each other and cause this swirling pattern. It's estimated the temperature of the fire of the brimstone was 6,000 degrees Fahrenheit in order to cause this pattern, or <laughs> about the temperature of the surface of the sun. Now the ashen remains appear to be man-made, shaped like buildings with right angles, arches, doorways, and other features that just can't be naturally occurring. And they are made out of the exact material we'd expect. Calcium sulfate, and embedded with millions of sulfur balls, so pure in form that they are found nowhere else on Earth. So this is exactly what we'd expect from the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. What isn't expected is the setup of the cities. Each individual set of buildings seems to be walled and fortified on its own, and the streets set up in a meandering fashion rather than in a square fortification. This may have been because in those days it's possible that flooding was an annual event of the Jordan as it is in Egypt with the Nile. Maybe that's why the ground was so fertile. If so, these elevated buildings may have allowed better drainage. At least that's our thought. But if this is the first time you're hearing about these ruins, one has to question why. Why, if these remains have been known since the 1990s, why are you just hearing about them now? Why haven't movies and documentaries been all over TV about a find like this that proves a Bible story? Why are the alternative sites for Sodom and Gomorrah, which don't match the biblical record, getting all the TV time and the genuine one isn't? The answer should be obvious. The Apostle Peter told us these runes have been left as an example for what is going to happen to the ungodly. In Malachi we also read, And ye shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet, in the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. The cities of the wicked will be ashes on the day of the Lord, just like Sodom and Gomorrah are now. And our ungodly culture doesn't want proof of a Bible story being true and certainly doesn't want an example like that of what's going to happen to them, possibly personally. So if the lifestyle there in Sodom was ungodly, <laughs> how ungodly was it? And do the remains support it? Do the runes speak? Let's start with the size of the cities and begin to look at other details as well. In this section of the Dead Sea, ancient cemeteries have been located where thousands of graves from this period have been discovered. Now those graves would not be of those destroyed in the fire and brimstone because at 6,000 degrees, a human body is vaporized. But it gives us some indication that these were very large cities before the destruction. Also, the runes are visible from Google Earth and Sodom seems to be about five square kilometers and Gomorrah about 2.5 square kilometers. And as we mentioned, there may have been wooden structures which completely burned up as well, making the towns even larger. From this, we can assume tens of thousands lived in each of the two larger cities. There were five city-states in the plain of the Jordan at the time of Sodom and Gomorrah, each with its own king. We learn this in Genesis as well. Then the king of Sodom, the king of Gomorrah, the king of Adma, the king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that is Zor, went out and they joined battle in the valley of Sidim. From this same account, we learn of one of the great natural resources of the area, Bitumen. Now the valley of Sidim was full of bitumen pits. That's Genesis 14.10. Bitumen is a soft asphalt-like material that burns easily and was used as fuel in the ancient world. Sodom and Gomorrah likely traded this with the rest of the Middle East. That may be part of the reason that Josephus said that the cities were rich. 
The Jordan Valley was also lush with vegetation at that time. Lot lifted up his eyes and saw that the Jordan Valley was well watered everywhere, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt. So it is likely they had great agricultural resources. These economic blessings led to slothfulness and laziness. Behold, this was the guilt of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters had pride, excess of food, and prosperous ease, but did not aid the poor and needy. And as we see, the prosperous ease didn't make them generous. They neglected the poor and needy. <laughs> Sounds a lot like our culture today. In terms of religion, the runes themselves give us an idea of their worship and gods. In the city of Gomorrah, there is a 40-foot-long remains of what appears to be a sphinx. And immediately adjacent to it is a pyramid, or ziggurat. This arrangement is much like the one in Giza, where the famous sphinx is adjacent to a pyramid there as well. So although we can't tell exactly what gods they worshipped, the similarity with Egypt architecturally leads us to believe they may have had a similar religion to Egypt's. The destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah was during the same time period as the height of Egyptian dynasties, so some bleed over of their religion was certainly possible. They weren't that far apart. They certainly did not worship Jehovah, the God of Abraham and Lot. However, ancient runes cannot tell us the level of depravity of the inhabitants of that city. What exactly took place there on those now deserted streets? Why were these specific cities punished so severely by God? Well, let's start with what God had to say about them. Now the men of Sodom were wicked, great sinners against the Lord. In Genesis 19, we learn that after the two angels visited Sodom, appearing as humans, a mob of men appeared desiring to rape them. The men of Sodom surrounded the house, both young and old, all the people from every quarter. And they called to Lot and said to him, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may have relations with them. We know from earlier in this video that Sodom was probably inhabited by tens of thousands. So this was likely a very large mob and it was made up of all ages and from all quarters of the city. So it was a pretty universal practice. And second, because Lot had been insistent with the angels when they first arrived that they stay at his house that night, he probably knew that this was how the men of Sodom treated strangers in their town. Perhaps he had been treated this way himself once. The angels blinded the men of Sodom, which protected them and Lot from the mob, and the next morning they were about to punish the town. The question is, why didn't God give that town a second chance? He's giving us a second chance today. God knows who will repent and who will not. In Romans 1.28, we read about how those being given over to these same types of unnatural passions eventually results in what the Bible terms a reprobate mind. The Greek word translated reprobate is a dokimos, meaning counterfeit. The root word was used for testing coins to see if they were genuine. So what is a counterfeit mind? What is a mind that cannot conceive the truth? A mind that doesn't work correctly? So were these specific towns at a point of no return as far as God was concerned? Evidently, they were. But we shouldn't think Sodom was the worst of sinners. They were just an example of what was coming. Here is what God had to say about Israel. For the iniquity of the daughter of my people is greater than the sin of Sodom, which was overthrown as in a moment. Now from our human perspective, we are not to judge who has such a reprobate mind and who doesn't. 
We should present the gospel to everybody. We should remember that some have this type of mind, however. So when Jesus told his disciples to shake off the dust as they went from town to town and were rejected, we should move on from those unreceptive or even opposed to our message. Pray for them, but move on. However, these runes are incredibly important to use as examples to the unrighteous world. The Bible has told us to use them that way. We've already saw what Peter had to say about this, and Jude also makes a similar comment. Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, since they, in the same way as those judged in gross immorality and went after strange flesh, are exhibited as an example in undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. How can we witness using these runes? Well, one of the best ways is to share this video on social media to reach as many as possible with these stunning videos and stunning scriptures. A second way is to learn the similar lessons that Jesus instructed us to learn from the account of Noah and the flood. Another Old Testament account that teaches us about the day of Jesus' return. To keep watching, click right here and find out about what the timing of the flood might teach us about the timing of the events surrounding the return of Jesus. Till then, this is Nelson, and I'll see you there.